In summer 2023, a video of a woman singing went viral. This woman was artist Shannon Blake. Although this video was a lip dub of a song she released the year prior, 2023 was the year major discourse around her started happening. This spawned tons of controversy everywhere. She was living rent-free on my TL for ages. Everywhere I looked, there would be posts of her. What is significant about her story is not so much the art or artist herself, but rather the conversations surrounding her and what her role in the modern cultural zeitgeist represents. The most iconic comment people made about this woman is that her parents worked for Lockheed Martin. This ultimately represents how people felt about her. Similar reactions came about, implying she must be rich, stating she appeared to be that of a poser. Her image seemed too polished to truly be a dirty hippie. Shannon's next viral sensation came about in spring 2024 with another lip dub of a song. While comments were pretty much the same on this video, it really amplified the discussion surrounding this woman. Again, this is the most interesting part about her, the reaction surrounding her persona. While we have a lot to say about her, we still have a lot left to understand about her. Therefore, our understanding or misunderstanding of her is embodied by two major points, ego and character. So let's figure this out. Was Shannon Blake misunderstood? Took a little bit of ice and let open and strong. Many criticize Shannon for being ironically egotistical for someone who appears to be so enlightened. How could someone presenting herself as a nature-loving hippie have the resources for recording such high-quality music production? And how could someone presenting herself as enlightened be so enamored in talking about herself so much? Another common critique is that she's some kind of psyop or industry plant. For sake of argument, I won't be examining these ideas. So, ego? She does sing about herself and her own experiences, but is this kind content actually about her, or is it about her experiencing her experiences? I'm only focusing on the lyrics of her viral snippets, as these are the lyrics the discourse has been centered around. Verse 2 of her 2022 song, Nature, is as follows. Took a little bit of acid, a little bit of shrooms. Did that tree just talk, or was it you? I could feel the sun on my skin, feeling my face melting, existential bliss. Oh my god, that's my love. I was floating through stardust. Lost in space, intertwined, I was feeling butterflies. Given that these lyrics are in the first person, is she technically singing about herself, or is she singing about something beyond herself? Perhaps the idea of herself as a mere passenger in the ride of the experience. All right, maybe a stretch. Let's just look at her second viral snippet from a 2024 song she released called Peru. I've been chilling in the mountains of Peru, drinking ayahuasca with the shamans too, cup of San Pedro to shift the mood. I've been learning about myself, finding out my truth. I've been healing my soul child, the best medicine. I've been learning shit from the aliens, like how we're all connected to the pyramids and how we used to use them for time traveling. Now I'm astral projecting, remembering how to. Navigate the ethers, sound heals didgeridoo. Singing bowls every lyric, medicinal truth, sound transforms DNA, my mind making things move. Kidney infection, I healed that too. I've been doing things your brain can't compute. They'll say it's magic, but you could do it too. Just open up your heart and let it channel through. The lyrics are of course more interesting in this snippet, as there is far more to unpack. She suggests she had a kidney infection. Anyone who has had a kidney infection understands the feeling of when a doctor tells you the news, to open up your heart and let it channel through. While she puts herself within this music, these lyrics tend to be more centered, again, around ideas rather than herself. She seems to be more of an effect rather than a cause from these lyrics. But again, 
People question her motivation for putting these works out there. Would an actual hippie have the means slash resources to do this? Travel the world like this? Or are all these activities and resources now just reserved for the rich? For the last few years, I've purchased tickets to attend a giant music festival near me. It is interesting to attend something like this as a white-collar corporate normie, but most of the people there are fellow white-collar corporate normies, because this experience is not cheap. You know, we look at those people who went to Woodstock back in the day, and we ask how did they grow up to be homeowners and conservatives? Even in the past, it did take money to travel the country and attend festivals. Most of them may not have been as dirt poor as history suggests. When I roam the sea of white collar individuals playing dress up at this music festival, there tends to be the rare case where you actually encounter someone genuine to the role they are playing. They've somehow scraped enough spare change in the seats of the van they live in to buy tickets for that year's festival. Meeting this person is encountering the archetype of the free spirit. People recognize this guy. They point to him, they say, hey, that guy has it figured out. He transcended his ego. He's not bound by humanity's illusions, man. He doesn't use social media. He's connected to nature. And he always has this unusual nickname. They say, oh yeah, yeah, we call him Moly. He goes by this nickname because I'm not sure he even has a name. He has no birth certificate. He was just born in a VW in a field. And I guess he doesn't believe in shoes or basic hygiene. And his diet is composed entirely of grilled cheese and cigarettes. You ask how a guy like Moldy survives, and people say, oh, well, he makes his living off selling tie-dye shirts he makes himself. You say, really? That, that's a lot of inventory. He makes his living off just doing that? And they say, well, that's technically his side gig. His main source of income comes from selling as many sheets of acid or pounds of shrooms as you would like. And you say, well, that might be a little intense. Does he sell any weed? And they say, what? No, he sells drugs, you idiot. Weed is not drugs. As a white-collar corporate normie, it really is a culture shock to encounter someone like Moldy. Like, what is this man's future plans? I mean, you, you really mean to tell me Moldy does not have a 401k? The archetype of Moldy and what he sells ties directly into our misunderstanding of psychoactives and the idea of their universal curability. Shannon Blake is known for singing a lot about doing hallucinogenics and the experiences she has from them. Drinking ayahuasca with the shaman stew. Took a little bit of ice, a little bit of shrooms. This relates to the ego, as these substances are notorious for dissolving the ego. The normalization and destigmatization of psychedelics is in large part due to the academic research of them being used for treatments. Therefore, the recreational use of them has now been becoming defended as a health-centered wellness endeavor. And I'm not focusing on the argument of whether or not sovereign adults should or should not be legally allowed to put whatever they want into their bodies. That answer is obvious. Instead, I am arguing whether we should use the umbrella term treatment for the average recreational user of these substances. The more people you meet who have done psychedelics, the more you realize these drugs really don't cure everybody. Using a microscope does not automatically make you a scientist. That is how a four-year-old views being a scientist. If you give an asshole enlightenment, they will just become an enlightened asshole. If you go through ego death or psychosis multiple times and still don't feel mentally healthier, I don't know, there might be a reason for that. Now, obviously, 
Obviously, altered states of consciousness do bring altered perspectives. I am by no means slamming that. There is significance in being able to personally see things from another point of view, but the key word is personally. If someone is a world traveler, telling you stories and constantly showing you pictures, <laughs> picture albums of their travels, and you've never traveled internationally, you would react to all this by saying, man, shut up. Like, I'm happy you enjoyed these experiences, but I didn't ask, and I have no idea where you're coming from with all this. Those are your experiences that you're now just using to be annoying. A common critique we see surrounding Shannon Blake is the comment that doing drugs does not make you spiritual. Doing drugs does not make you connected to nature. And really, I guess in Shannon's defense, these comments are kind of the point. The idea that Shannon should be above the ego just because she has done psychedelic drugs is a completely faulty premise based on how much more we have left to learn about these substances. We have yet to learn not to put them on so high of an existentially valid pedestal. Things go way deeper than that. It's a question of understanding the idea of character. The best medicine. I've been learning shit from the aliens. When we examine some of the most prominent independent artists of the last few years, one name that comes to mind is Tom McDonald. I understand this is a weird example, but we're already looking at some weird artists, so stick with me. McDonald is a rapper who has rhetoric known for being anti-establishment, with heavy criticism of woke culture. His music frequently touches on controversial social and political topics in the United States. He has gained massive success as an independent artist, with multiple placements on the Billboard charts, multiple number one IT iTunes downloads, and over 1 billion views collectively across his music videos on YouTube. While he has a lot of fans, he is also massively hated. His songs tend to touch on how overly sensitive people can be, and his lyrics are an expression of his fringe, outlandish, dangerous, underground, conservative perspectives. He's gotten so big, he somehow convinced Ben Shapiro, of all people, to be featured in a song, causing both fans and critics alike of Shapiro to say, Dude, what the hell am I watching? McDonald's controversy has caused him to strike a chord with so much of America, because he is what America is all about. He is all about this nation. This man bleeds red, pees white, and poops blue. Yes, he needs to go to a hospital, but when you're this much of an American patriot, <laughs> you better try to avoid medical care, because this is America. America is what this man is all about because he was born and raised in none other than the great United States of... Wait, wait, what? Canada? Uh, uh, guys, I think you might be playing a character here. When looking at some of my personal favorite rappers, one of my favorite artists from the past decade was Lil Peep. I liked him because he was a pioneer of his craft. I had never ever heard music like he made. He sampled music from genres I actually listened to. His mixtapes explored emo, trap, lo-fi, and alternative rock, and his debut album was even a transition into pop punk and rap rock. As the first prominent sound in emo rap, Lil Peep has been described as the Kurt Cobain of lo-fi rap, his music being gloomy and diabolically melodic. His lyrical themes include topics such as depression, drug use, past relationships, and suicidal thoughts. I mean, all of this dude's songs were gloomy. I can maybe think of a few songs that maybe had more of a happy tone to them. And there's the question. Why did every single song have this theme? Why was it so consistent? Was it just part of the art? 
Some of those closest to Lil Peep claimed he was a lot happier in real life than his music may have suggested. After all, Lil Peep was ultimately an entertainer. He could put whatever he wanted in his lyrics. I mean, just because he sang about wanting to overdose on drugs and die young doesn't mean he actually, oh, oh. Okay, um, bad example. Lil Peep came to be an inspiration to outcasts and youth subcultures drawn together by the internet. The large amount of his posthumous songs that continue to get released are a testament of his dedication to his art, his drive, his motivation in the face of his struggles. In an interview with People magazine following his death, Lil Peep's older brother Oscar spoke out on the character of Peep, claiming this man was super happy with where he was in life. The quote that stands out most in this article is as follows. It makes me laugh to think about the days we watched WWE together, but Pete mentioned how being a hip-hop artist is like being a pro wrestling character. You have to be an actor. He gets paid to be sad. It's what he made his name on. It's what his image was in a sense. I remember seeing that quote and I never considered it from that perspective. The possibility that he was embracing a character in this manner. While Lil Peep and Tom McDonald are very different artists, it is noteworthy to consider that Tom actually used to be a pro wrestler. He actively competed between the years 2003 and 2009, wrestling for several Canadian promotions such as PWA and MPW, while also appearing at events alongside WCW and WWE superstars. I have watched a few WWE pay-per-view events, and though pro wrestling isn't necessarily for me, I can definitely understand why people are drawn to it. The biggest hurdle anyone comes to when initially watching wrestling events like this is stating, I don't understand. It's all scripted. When pointing out these events and matches are obviously planned and scripted, you realize that is the most significant reason pro wrestling fans enjoy this art. They do not care that it's scripted. They love that it is scripted because they're not exactly drawn to sports. They're drawn to characters. These people who train to be professional wrestlers are training to be actors that play characters. Every match is a battle between characters and an examination into the stories of why characters have the relationships they do. If a character is massively hated, the character will dive even deeper into their off-putting persona, which makes the fans even more drawn to them. The fans actually love the villains as much as they love the heroes. Pro wrestling fans love to hate and love to love because they are passionate about the sheer energy of the characters they see. Even when you remove all the violence. Pro wrestling is still a portrayal of our barbaric, animalistic nature when it comes to being entertained. There is popularity through being hated. And popularity through being hated is something we've observed more and more through time, especially in the world of music. Obviously, marketing is what currently makes an artist more than the quality of the art itself, but we're realizing some interesting things about this marketing. Again, forget about the quality of the art, just remove quality from the equation. While we think an icon needs to be appreciated for its positive nature of character, we realize this is definitely not the case. An icon can be appreciated for its negative nature of character. We are drawn to so many stories through characters, even if the characters are not upstanding individuals. It's their energy we like. It's the sheer magnitude of how deep they go into being the kind of person they are. It's about how deep you can go into being the flavor of something. Music genres are flavors 
Shockingly, it's all character development. The songs Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana, All the Small Things by Blink-182, and Kids by MGMT were all massive hits. But what most people don't realize is these songs were actually written as jokes. They were not intended to be as big as they got. These artists actually wrote these songs to be parodies of pop music, mimicking everything they hated about pop music for each era they existed in. Perhaps these songs became hits because they sounded similar to the other pop songs that surrounded them, but we must consider perhaps these songs became hits because these artists really had to study music. They had to really pay attention to mimic every aspect and fully dive into the character of the kind of persona they wanted to portray in each piece of art. These artists were each creating characters within these songs, and fans recognized this perhaps subconsciously. In a magnitude of forms, people are always drawn to characters. Shannon Blake is a character, and her being hated online falls right in line with this phenomena. Whether people love or hate Shannon, we are drawn to her because she represents a flavor of something. This free spirit who doesn't use deodorant and lives in a forest. Whether shaping this persona is intentional or unintentional on her part is completely arbitrary when considering the nature of what makes us entertained. If Shannon is indeed playing a character, she is doing an awesome job at it. But that's just commentary on a character. That's not commentary on her character. If we want to get personal about her, what is her character like? Just open up your heart and let it channel so was Shannon Blake misunderstood? We need to understand what's going on here. In a March 2024 article that Shannon claims to be the most accurate piece written about her, we can learn more about her personal life and how she got to where she is. I would have guessed she was younger than me, but it turns out she's actually about to be 30. She claims, my mom was a singer-songwriter and had a guitar that I tried to play when I was 14, but I hated it at first. Then I kind of fell in love with Jack Johnson and wanted to be able to do what he does. Her first video, which was uploaded to YouTube in April 2013, had a vibe much different from what we see today. Simple music, more down to earth, of her just playing a ukulele and singing. It's clear to see from these early videos just how much she's enjoyed making music through the years. Something else people don't realize about her is that she is also a mother. She was 18 when she had her daughter named June. She has been raising her only child as a single mother, which she is proud of. Her daughter's dad was jailed, and Shannon says being a single mom has been the most empowering gift I could have ever asked for. But at the same time, watching my daughter's heart break over and over because of the actions of this guy who is supposed to be her father feels more like a curse. To be this dedicated to her art while being a single mother cannot be an easy feat. This does provide more insight into asking who is Shannon Blake. Shannon has been practicing music half her life and has been releasing content for over 10 years. She's explored multiple genres and tried many things to finally land on the persona she is now embracing. As cringe as the flavor of her character may come off to many people, you honestly have to respect the dedication she's had in the face of adversity. I mean, she grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah with a poor background, and now she has claimed a big name for herself and a large and growing following. She became a millionaire before 30, and she did it all without creating an OnlyFans. Wait, 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 no, 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 why? Every f***ing time, man. That's an unusual way to use a bong.
While there are many perspectives we can have on Shannon Blake, there are always things we do not know about someone in the public light. An artist is always prone to being misunderstood. This is nothing new. But while an artist is prone to being misunderstood, an artist is always prone to being understood by the fans that embrace the artist's character.